challenges are massive, you know, and I've, I've, um, I've worked in troubled neighborhoods, communities for, for most of my, most of my adult life, you know, in the 1980s, um, I, I worked in an education program for, uh, um, a homeless service agency in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I've worked with schools in trouble, and Albemarle County, you know, has in the top three percent of counties in America for income inequity. So it's a, um, it's a, you know, it's a huge problem. So we have kids who go home to houses where the parents literally play polo, and we have kids who go home to dirt floor shacks with no indoor plumbing. Um, and, and everything in between, we have 70-something languages spoken in our schools. Um, it's, you know, we, we face all of those things. There are, there are a couple of things that I think are essential in terms of how you challenge the inequities. One is, and I had a kind of um, contested exchange with the XQ Super Rules Foundation a few months ago, where I said, I said to them, I don't think you understand. You know, you're handing out $10 million grants to build great schools. There are great schools all over the country. That's not what we're lacking. What we're lacking is great system, you know, where every kid in the system has the same opportunities. And that's that's the difficult thing to create. So, so there's a belief in A, the structures of, of inequity, but there's also the philosophy of inequity. And I say a lot, and we even ask this in job interviews, even for people who were becoming um, technicians for our technology department. You know, I, I say all the time, kids in poverty don't come to school knowing less, they know different. Um, and how do you support that difference? So long ago, I was in one of our highest poverty rural schools. And, you know, and you know, this kind of school, it's where you not only get breakfast, but you send home dinner for the family every day, right? Um, and all weekend long. And um, so you un you understand this, and we all understand what this kind of place looks like. But um, Pam had just given me a, a kid's book about the ship's cat on the Titanic. And so I, I walked into the school, I said to the librarian, this was sort of, you know, just uh, off the cuff moment. I said, Christy, I want you to read this book with the kids, and while they're doing it, I'm going to teach them how to multitask. And she was like, what? <laughs> I said, let's go get a class, somebody who's, we get right now, and we grab this group of fourth graders with a substitute teacher, I had no idea what was going on, so it was probably really unfair, but we passed out laptops to the kids, not enough for everyone to have one, and we did that deliberately, so kids had to share and, and work together. And... I said to the kids, we're going to do what everyone does now, which is when they're listening to something, they look up what they don't know, you know, and they, um, and they, you know, spread that knowledge around. So the book opens in Belfast in Northern Ireland. And, and the first question was, it said UK. And somebody said, what does UK mean? And one kid yells, University of Kentucky. And and then this other girl says, well, that's stupid. Kentucky doesn't have an ocean. And I'll point out that you don't need a whole lot of background knowledge to make the leap into where you're going. You know, so just knowing that Kentucky didn't have an ocean was enough to get this group through community cognition into a different place. And they kept moving through this. And, you know, people were shouting out possibilities and answers and so it was absolutely fascinating. You know, kids were, um, once they connected with the whole Google Earth thing, they were looking up, you know, uh, Belfast and Southampton in England and, of course, houses. And you say, well, that's okay because that's part of the learning. Um, when it was done, the teacher just grabbed the laptop, told the kids not to log out. You know, she looked through the search histories and she said everyone was on task. And I said, of course, they were sort of interested, you know, as a, as a thing. She, she was so excited by it. She called up a friend who was a library, our highest average income school, and said, hey, you got to try this. You know, this is so great. And two days later, I get an 
email back from that other librarian who says, my kids can't do it. And I said, what do you mean they can't do it? She said, they're not willing to take the chance of giving a wrong answer, right? The kids in that community are are raised to believe that there's only a right answer to things. And their judgment skills are way below the judgment skills of kids who come from impoverished, at-risk homes where judgment is what keeps them alive, right? So you have to look at what the capabilities are that come with kids' backgrounds and jump with it. We, Pam and I often show um, a picture when we do presentations that freaks people out. It's an eight-year-old on a chop saw, um, and uh, he's – but there are a couple of things about this picture that are okay. So uh, say to the kid, um, well, this is really interesting. Uh, you know, do you think you need an adult with you? And, and there were adults in sight, but, you know, the kid – I don't know why I'm the expert. Um, now, this is, again, a rural kid, but who knows about tools, you know? And what he was doing was building a giant Jenga set for the kindergarten at his school. Um, so there's empathy, there's, you know, brilliant level of measuring, there's letting him be the expert in that situation and and finding the success. One of the things we found when we converted all our summer schools into maker camps, realizing that summer school accomplishes almost nothing for anybody when it's untraditionally, um, because doubling down on what didn't work all year um, rarely has has a successful um, end to it. So we eliminated the apparent academic content, a whole group of kids who had never seen success before found it and and ran with it and then when they came back to come back to school in the fall they have the ability to be leaders and to be you know fully sort of accepted in things the other thing that i'll say is you don't need a ton of resources to pull everything off we um alamo county you know, what makes it a decent test bed is it's the median sized school district in the country with the median amount of funding. But that means half the schools in the country have less, sometimes way, way less. However, our most successful things are done because you change the attitude. One of our first real classroom transformations came when a third grade teacher said to me eight years ago, he said, I got two questions for you. He said, I don't know how much furniture I need in my room. And he said, I need more whiteboards. And so I looked around the room and said, Michael, why don't you get rid of three quarters of the furniture you have? Your kids are more comfortable on the floor anyway. And I said, and by the way, the floor looks white enough to me to use as a whiteboard. And that simple act, getting rid of stuff and saying, it's okay to write on the floor, we can clean it up later um changed everything about that room and i remember just a little lesson that happened say a month earlier a month later um kids were talking about communities and michael said the teacher said why don't you know you get into groups and start drawing maps of your community on the floor well the kids were all over the floor they're drawing all these streets and buildings and stuff and um two groups bang into each other as the, as they're expanding out and they get into a fight over whose ground it is that requires the other two groups in the class to mediate well you couldn't have a better activity um so it's not it's not like you need to go buy steel case furniture um that's you know that's not the thing arduinos cost $15 a piece, you know, uh, and kids can program anything they want with it. There are ways to do things much less expensively. We, we did a um, big project this summer, opening a new high school center um, that's, that's another pilot, a school without classrooms or classes. Um, the furniture came from Wayfair and Ikea commercial primarily. Um, they're commercial entities. Um, the, we had an interior designer who wanted to spend half a million dollars on furniture. In the end, we spent 70000 You You do what you can, and 
you know, it's um, in 2013, well, in 2012, we, we did a thing where we, we simply pulled all the money left in, in everybody's budgets in January, whether it was technology or building services or instruction. And we, we gathered for the 26 schools, we gathered together like a million, $1.2 million. Uh, and we said to all 26, tell us what you want to do that will allow kids to do something they couldn't do before. And it wasn't a competitive grant thing because we funded every school. It, it didn't matter what the project were. Now, $1.2 million spread across 26 schools is not very much money, right? But one school that's majority Spanish speaking sent teachers to a Central American language immersion camp. Others knocked down walls, others bought technology, some bought furniture. You know, but but we wanted to show that with very little money, we could drive change in, in significant ways. And if you realize that you can furnish a school, and by the way, this wasn't just a school. There were three projects together in that $70,000, um, um, a whole office suite and a whole professional learning center were, were also in that. If you say this is how much money you have, you can figure out how to get where you need to go. Um, but the the other thing, is, you know, that that's critical is it's not the stuff that makes the biggest difference. It's the philosophy. And I knew we had made a transformation down here, and it was you know in 2013 that one of the assistant superintendents said to me, Ira. Somebody's building a new house near where I am, and there's all this stuff out there, lumber and cardboard. He said, I loaded it all up in the back of my pickup truck. Who do you want me to give it to, right? <laughs> um, you know, so so um, cardboard and the little blades they make for saber saws that you can buy like 20 for $2 at, at Lowe's, you know, and kids can build anything. Um, you don't. You don't need the resources. You have to trust childhood and adolescent curiosity and, you know, the native um, drive to learn that's in all humans. 